Uh, this special hearing of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission forced organ harvesting in China, examining the evidence uh, will come to order. And I thank again our very distinguished panel uh, for taking the time for their leadership uh, and for being here this morning. And I do want to thank our staff, uh, Georgina, uh, Piero, and Young, uh, uh, for their work, John, uh, for their incredible work on, on this issue in general. Uh, and I, again, uh, I appreciate all of the great human rights work you're doing. You know, my friends, in marketing and marking the centennial anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party last year, a China State Council Information Office released a white paper titled The Ch Communist Party of China and Human Rights Protection, a 100-year quest, close quote. And this particular piece of government propaganda, the CCP claimed that, quote, for 100 years, the CCP has always put people first, applying the principle of universality of human rights in the context of the national conditions, close quote. The sheer chutzpah of this statement and the stark unreality of its claim stands in stark contrast to the everyday reality of what we see with our very own eyes and know to be true, especially from the diaspora and from the human rights activists inside of China, a reality which today shows Shanghai apartment dwellers under the guise of Xi Jinping's zero COVID policy being subjected to unprecedented neglect, mistreatment, and abuse. Indeed, one could rewrite that statement to say that for 100 years, the Chinese Communist Party has always put people last, standing the principle of universality of human rights on its head by cynically and cruelly using people as a means to its ends. Indeed, nowhere is that principle of utter disregard for the dignity of the human person and of using people as a utilitarian means to an end, more apparent than in the horrific practice of harvesting the organs of human beings even before they meet the standard of brain death. What compounds the shock to the conscience is not simply the execution of people declared enemies of the state, as if in order to provide certain organ uh, to me, or certain organ to meet transplant needs, but that this is also an apparent form of punishment and indeed a to tool of genocide meant to call minority populations deemed, quote, undesirable by the state. Thus, we see religious dissidents targeted for harvesting. First and foremost, the Falun Gong, whose peaceful meditation and exercise practices unfortunately make their organs desirable. They are declared an evil cult by the Chinese Communist Party uh, and thus fit for butchering. We also know and see bone chilling evidence, which Ethan Gutman uh, will elaborate on, of Uyghurs and other Central Asian minorities, roughly 28 years old, deemed the ideal age for organ ripeness by the Chinese medical establishment, subjected to comprehensive blood tests to find a cross match for organ recipients. Between 2.5 and 5% of these 28 year olds in concentration camps disappear a year. That is the call rate, and it may even be higher. Sifting through the evidence, an independent body, an international tribunal sitting in London, has concluded that, quote, forced organ harvesting has been committed for years throughout China on a significant scale, and that Falun Gong practitioners have been one and probably the main source of organ supply. Those calls from more than 1.5 million detainees in Chinese prison camps who are being killed for their organs, serve a booming transplant trade that is worth some $1 billion a year. We are fortunate to have one as one of our witnesses today, the head of that tribunal, Sir Jeffrey Nice. Regrettably, despite the Chinese Communist Party's claim of initiating reforms to the transplant system and reducing transplant tourism, troubling stories of abuse continue to come to light. There's been no abatement. It's gotten worse. As one of our expert witnesses, Dr. Matthew Robertson of the Australian National University will explain to us today, the conclusions of a groundbreaking article he co-authored with uh, Dr. J Jacob Lavie. Namely, nearly 3,000 Chinese medical journal articles published between 1980 and 2015, during which time the Chinese government said it would stop procuring organs 
from executed prisoners tell an entirely different story. That doctors in China performed organ transplants without following the standard procedures for establishing brain death. Their work, recently published in a top peer reviewed US medical journal, is a testament to Chinese egregious lies and violation of international standards and indeed the most fundamental standards of humanity. Though this still shocks me, and it's sad, it doesn't surprise me, nor does it surprise other uh, people who very seriously follow human rights abuse in China. More than two decades ago, I actually chaired a human rights hearing in my subcommittee. It was probably the first hearing, and I believe it was. Uh, we had a Chinese security official who testified that he and other security agents were executing prisoners, and he had photographs and, and documentation that he brought with him with doctors there and ambulances to harvest their organs. And that was one of, at least one of the beginnings of this horrific practice. More recently in this Congress, I, along with my Democratic colleague, Tom Swazi and Senator Tom Cotton, who has the companion bill in the Senate, we introduced the Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Act to establish measures to combat forced organ harvesting and the international trafficking in persons to remove their organs. These measures include one, establishing property blocking and visa blocking sanctions, two, prohibiting exports of certain uh, surgery devices to entities that are identified as being responsible for forced organ harvesting or related human trafficking, and three, requiring the Department of State to report on these practices. But much more needs to be done. This bill needs to be passed by the House and the Senate and signed by the president, and much more needs to be done and the fight must go on. We in the West, especially in the medical field, must examine our moral complicity in these most heinous of crimes. Despite the search for immortality, and we all, you know, organ transplants when done properly and ethically uh, are something that are life-saving, but the transplantation of a new heart or liver or other organ that is failing uh, cannot cause any of us to turn a blind eye as to where the origin of such organs. Why is there medical tourism to China? Why are Chinese transplant doctors invited to conferences in the West, especially when they're committing horrific human rights abuses? Why specifically was Dr. Wang Haibo and China's former Deputy Health Minister Wang Jifu invited to conferences run by the Pontifical Academy of Sciences? where a bishop named Sanchez Sarando gave a metaphorical benediction to the lies uh, which they told regarding the state of organ harvesting in China today. China organ harvesting and the industry that it has created is truly barbaric and we can accept no more excuses. We do not want more false promises. We need answers. We need a concentrated effort to stop this barbaric practice, not only in China, but also by its global enablers. And again, I thank our distinguished witnesses for being here. Uh, and before uh, going to them, um, uh, if another member would like to uh, make any opening comments, certainly it's open to them. Uh, but if not, I will then go to our, our very distinguished witnesses. I would like to now introduce uh, Sir Jeffrey Nice, who is the former chair of the China Tribunal, an independent tribunal led by civil society, commissioned by the International Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China, and Falun Gong practitioners to examine forced organ harvesting and to investigate criminal offenses. As chair of the independent tribunal forced into forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience, released a 562-page judgment published in March of 2020, which concluded that tens of thousands of innocent individuals, ranging from Falun Gong practitioners, Uyghur, Tibetans, Muslims, and Christians, have been killed, even while still alive, for their kidneys, livers, hearts, lungs, corneas, uh, and skin, among other body parts. Since 2021, uh, Sir Nice has been the chair of the Uyghur Tribunal, an independent people's tribunal in the UK, sponsored uh, by the World Uyghur Tribunal, that examines and evaluates human rights abuses against the Uyghur people in relation to the 1948 Genocide Convention, adopted by 152 countries in 
in the UN General Assembly, and it includes China. Prior to his current role, Sir Nice uh, led the prosecution of Slobodan Milosevic, former socialist president of Serbia at the UN International Tribunal, or the ICTY, uh, in The Hague. I am incredibly thankful for the work that he did uh, on the ICTY, uh, and I convened landmark hearings myself and led a concurrent resolution to press for the investigation of criminal culpability and, and public indictment of Slobodan Milosevic, who had helped lead to the formation of the ICTY, uh, and met with him in Serbia and argued and argued and argued like so many others. Uh, and finally, when he was being prosecuted, as we all know, he passed away before uh, that trial was over. Then we have Matthew uh, Robertson, um, who is a China Studies Research Fellow with the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. He is also pursuing his doctorate in political science in the Australian National University in Canberra. Uh, on April 4th of 2022, Mr. Robertson, along with Dr. Jacob uh, Lavi, co-authored an article entitled Execution by Organ Procurement Breaking the Dead Donor Rule in China which used statistical forensics, demonstrated the falsification of Chinese donor registry data between 1980 and 2015. His article is published in the American Journal of Transplantation, a top peer reviewed publication. His large scale computerized uh, textual analysis of nearly 3000 Chinese academic papers uh, reveals that individuals could not have been possibly declared brain dead and the surgeons in the PRC have executed individuals by organ removal. What a horrific practice. Mr. Robertson's testimony describes China's extensive systematic organ harvesting campaign, which relies heavily upon prisoners and the country's practically non-existent regulations and legal frameworks, which ultimately failed to promote ethical voluntary organ donations. Our witness also describes the inherent disconnect between donor lists provided by the Chinese government and the rapidly growing number of of thousands of organ transplantations uh, annually. In addition, his statistical model shows the inherent anomalies and impossibilities uh, in official data sets, revealing the Chinese government's action to execute in individuals uh, during organ transplantation before they could be declared dead, brain dead. Ethan Gutman is the senior research fellow in China studies for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation and co-founder of the International Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China. As a longtime advocate against forced organ harvesting, surveillance, forced labor, and genocide in China, Mr. Gutman has testified before the Congressional Executive Commission on China, the European Parliament, and the United Nations, and in 2017 was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He has also written several publications on these critically important matters like Losing the New China, and the slaughter. His book is he is currently working on the Xinjiang uh, procedure, which draw on his personal interviews with Uyghur and Kazakh refugees throughout Central Asia. In his testimony, he brings to light his investigation of witness testimony of individuals formerly in re-education camps in the PRC, and as I said earlier, uh, a 20-year-old uh, and others who are disappearing. Uh, and he'll get into that during his testimony. Uh, then we'll hear from Dr. Enver Toti, uh, who is formerly uh, a former oncology surgeon who was ordered by the Chinese government to carry out the first known case of live organ harvesting in 1994. He had over 13 years of experience in the Railway Central Hospital before he fled the People's Republic of China to the United Kingdom due to political reasons. His, in addition to having firsthand information of forced organ harvesting, Dr. Tohi, Tohi uh, discovered the connection between the highly disproportionate malignant tumor rate and the nuclear test site at Lupnor region. Uh, and and uh, so he has been a truth teller for quite a long time. For From his written testimony, we'll hear his story of the PRC government's execution on demand for organs, as well as how he witnessed individuals, oftentimes young boys, with U-shaped scars, which most likely indicated they were missing a kidney. It is truly disturbing and chilling. It is a horror story reading your firsthand accounts, but we thank you for speaking out and for the pivotal role in the campaign that you are playing uh, in this fight. 
Then we'll hear from um, Secretary Robert Destro, professor of law at Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law, and he did serve as former representative for Tibetan issues in the State Department and as the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor under the Trump administration. During his role as Assistant Secretary, he worked, and that's the point man, the point person for human rights in the administration. He worked on efforts to stop goods and services produced by slave labor, as well as to monitor and develop reports on human rights, religious freedom, and human trafficking. His written testimony asked a critical question. What should the US government officials be doing with credible evidence of government-sponsored organ harvesting? And I look forward to his elaboration uh, on this as well. I, I thank all of our witnesses for being here. I'd like to now yield to uh, Congressman Bill Arrakis, who has joined us, who has been a true leader on religious freedom around the globe. Um, uh, uh, Mike, uh, Gus, I should say, uh, Mike was his dad. I knew him well too. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, you've been a great mentor because you came in prior to me on these particular issues and I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, good morning and thank you again to our co-chairs uh, my good friend, of course, Chris Smith, and my good friend, James McGovern, he's a good man, for holding this hearing today. China has a long history using a variety of repressive methods as a part of a genocidal campaign to forcibly remove the people and culture of certain religious and ethnic minorities within China. The topic of today's hearing, organ harvesting, has far too long been swept under the rug by the international community. While this heinous practice has been used against a variety of ethnic and religious groups like the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, the Muslims and Christians and Falun Gong practitioners in particular have been the target of the CCP. Falun Gong is a traditional spiritual discipline founded by in 1992 and only four years later started facing oppressive uh, oppression from the state, which has only increased in intensity, unfortunately. Falun Gong practitioners suffer from persecution, intimidation, and imprisonment, torture, and even death at the hands of the CCP solely because of adherence to their personal beliefs. They are the main source of er organs illegally harvested by the Chinese government and are particularly targeted for other brutal treatment and torture while being held in Chinese prisons, concentration camps, and detention facilities. This is not something that just affects people in China, but even my constituents, my constituent Yu Zhu and his family are Falun Gong practitioners. A couple months ago, his father was abducted from his home in China without any charge being leveled or any notification to his family. Weeks later, Yu finally heard news of his abduction, but the local police and detention center would not confirm his father's status or allow anyone to communicate with him. Yu contacted my office, and Yu is a good friend of mine, but Yu contacted my office and I was able to write a letter on his family's behalf to the Chinese government. Weeks later, and with pressure from my office, the local police finally confirmed the imprisonment of his father and the charge he was being held with. I have since sent follow-up letters to the Chinese government, continuing to advocate on Dijon Yu's behalf and against his unjust imprisonment. The United States and our allies must send a strong and unwavering message in defense of basic human rights and protections for all people. I'm encouraged by EU High Representative Joseph Borrell's recent statement on China's organ harvesting and asserting that, and I quote, respect for human rights is not an option and I, I wholeheartedly agree. The right to worship and freedom of belief must be protected throughout the globe. No person should ever be intimidated, 
forced from their ancestral homeland, imprisoned, or murdered because of their beliefs. This has been something I've fought for my entire congressional career as the co-chair of the International Religious Freedom Caucus and as a member of the executive committee for this particular commission. I'm proud uh, to co-sponsor my friend, my good friend's bill, Chris Smith, the Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Act of 2021, and thank him for his leadership on this particular issue, and also co-sponsor, proud co-sponsor, the Falun Gong Protection Act. I will continue to work with my friend and our like-minded colleagues to get these bills passed into law. It's past time we stop China's brutal treatment of its own citizens. And I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bilirakis, uh, for your very powerful statement and again for your leadership. It's, it's tremendous. I'd like to now yield the floor to Sir Jeffrey Nice. And again, I thank him for making the time and all of our witnesses uh, to be with us today. Um, uh, Sir Jeffrey, uh, if you could unmute, I think uh, we can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Smith there it is. and all your colleagues. I've submitted a short five-side statement, which I hope is the part of the record, and I don't propose to read it out. There'd be little point. As you will appreciate from that or from other non other information, both tribunals that I chaired are explicitly purposefully non-activist and therefore there will be nothing said by me uh, arguing the conclusions of either tribunal or expressing any views on the fundamental issues that i know are strongly or subject to strong opinions by you and some of your colleagues it is i think more important and i hope more valuable simply for me to explain the process whereby the china tribunal judgment and indeed the Uyghur tribunal judgment were reached. Picking up on one of your earlier observations, Chairman Smith, um, you may find it helpful to be reminded that at paragraph 200, 20 rather, at paragraph 20 of the China tribunal judgment, we set out some of the earlier efforts made to bring this matter to public attention and to formal national or international action. And in the list of those events, the United States comes out really rather well, you may think. Indeed, I suspect, but I might be wrong, that the 20 year old event you spoke to may just possibly be the subcommittee on trade in the House on Ways and Means. Is that the one? It may be of 2001. There was one even before that. I had Harry Wu come and testify, and he was one who brought the, uh, yes, uh, the card. Uh, it was even it, before that. But that was a great hearing, yeah. too. Great yeah, I, and I've read the Kerry Wu one. And, of course, his, his history in your country was uh, a little mixed overall and in the end. But he provided an answer almost off, an almost offhand answer, not offhand, casual answer to a question which you can find at the foot of the record of that hearing, he provided an explanation for the process whereby prisoners were taken from detention uh, in order to have their organs extracted. He describes the process, as I recall, of their being, in a sense, bribed by good food to conduct themselves in a certain way that would make the whole process easier for the authorities, and then found themselves shot in the yard of the hospital before being the subject of extraction. So thank you for reminding me of that and that important piece of evidence, although it didn't feature in the judgment. But apart from that, then there's the 2001 subcommittee hearing of the United States. And as I cast my eyes over paragraph 20, there was a 2016 subcommittee. There was a resolution in the same year. There was a 2018 commission. Why do I mention these matters as well as recording that which I know slightly more easily from contact with parliamentarians at home, namely that the matter was raised periodically and indeed 
probably regularly in both houses of parliament to no effect in England, because it was the inability of the research that was readily available by one means or another to cut through to government that led eventually to ETAC, the NGO that commissioned me to uh, chair the China Tribunal. It was that inability to cut through for whatever reason, and we can guess the reason, that led to the need for a people's tribunal. Before I come to the formation of that tribunal, in order to explain to you beyond what you already know and possibly to others listening, um, how the tribunal was, was formed, it's very important to take a dispassionate look at the evidence that existed between 2000 and when we started work on the China Tribunal. There were three completely different researchers, Mr. Goodman, from whom you're going to hear, an investigative journalist, um, David Matas, a human rights lawyer, and the recently uh, departed David Kilgour, uh, Secretary of State for Canada of extreme eminence, working separately and then together, all reaching the same conclusion and all notwithstanding efforts of NGOs unable to get through to government. And when I was asked to do something different, namely to write an opinion on the material that would be available to me, about the Falun Gong, I asked if the NGO concerned thought a people's tribunal would be appealing. And I understood the fact that they thought it would be extremely unappealing. <laughs> Why would they suddenly want somebody else to look at the matter and possibly to reach a different conclusion? But without pressure from me, they came back eventually and said, yes, please, would we set one up? And with Mr. Hamid Sabi, who has great experience in running impartial tribunals of this kind, we established the China Tribunal. And what is, I think, important for everyone to understand is that the Tribunal and also the Uyghur Tribunal were always composed, were composed of individuals with no interest of any kind, not interested in the Uyghurs, not interested in the Falun Gong, not interested in communism, not interested in China. Their sole interest was in filling a gap in knowledge left as a gap between because official national and international bodies that might have acted failed to act. I don't know if I'm already extending beyond my permitted time, Mr. Smith. Please take whatever time you need. It's well, I should most important. Oh, thank you. So the procedure that we adopted in order to provide for others a usable and valuable conclusion was to have uh, tribunal members of the kind I've described, so not interested, not committed, for them to be completely unpaid and for them to be unable to put money into the project. They were there solely for the purpose of their reasoning powers for them to be presented with evidence on a fair basis from the mass of evidence gathered, including any evidence that was available favorable to the PRC, to invite the PRC to attend and not to hold against the PRC the many occasions on which they simply failed to respond to invitations, failed to answer questions, or were ad hominem offensive to me or generally offensive to the tribunal. We applied the law which was directed to us by individual advi uh, independent advisors only when the law was absolutely clear. And we tested both the factual evidence and then the legal factual conclusions on the strictest basis, proof beyond reasonable doubt. Nothing less would do. That led us in the case of the China Tribunal, as you have already summarized the careful analysis of the genocide allegations and to find that although some of the constituent elements to prove genocide were established, it was not, and we were not in a position to be satisfied so as to feel sure about the mental state element. 
so we set that aside. We nevertheless found um, proof beyond reasonable doubt crimes against humanity in respect of murder, extermination, imprisonment, torture, rape, and enforced disappearance. And we found torture. And, and I'll conclude in this way because it's very important to recognize we made no recommendations. We did not expect to take over running other people's lives for them. And we did assume that seized with a reliable judgment, other people would do their duty. And indeed, since then, the position has become clear that people will act on the basis of the judgment of the China Tribunal. We went no further than to say that governments and any who interact in any substantial way with the PRC, including doctors, medical institutions, industry, businesses, etc., educational establishments and art establishments, should recognize to the extent revealed in the judgment for interacting with a criminal state. We left matters there for you and others to take your responsibilities forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jeffrey Nice, uh, for that. Again, the, the leadership and the beyond reasonable doubt standard that you have applied, uh, and you have given us, all of us around the world who care about uh, these victims, uh, such a a foundation uh, to act upon. So deeply, deeply grateful. I'd like to now turn and, and yield uh, to uh, Matthew Robertson uh, for such time as he may consume. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, I will present my, um, my statement. Um, members of Congress, as you'll hear from the other witnesses, gathering reliable data about China's organ transplantation system is extremely difficult. Since 2016, I've collaborated with Dr. Jakob Levy, a cardiac transplant surgeon, professor of surgery at Tel Aviv University, and ethical leader in organ transplants globally, in studying China's transplant system. We published two major scientific papers since then. I'm very pleased to discuss these works, but please let me place them in context. In the developed world, transplant organs come from voluntary donors. Executed prisoners are typically forbidden from donating their organs. The role of governments is to establish the legal and regulatory framework around ethical voluntary donation. China is unique here in several respects. It's the only country that runs what ha that has run what amounts to a state-sanctioned organ trafficking business out of its hospitals, while systematically using prisoners as the almost sole source of organs over many decades. Since 2015, authorities say they've stopped the practice, but there are good reasons to doubt these claims, and I'll discuss that in a moment. Secondly, China had no regulatory framework around organ transplantation at all until 2007. And because China is not a rule of law country, there's no guarantee that any regulations that do exist get enforced anyway. In the year 2000, China's transplant system began to grow extremely rapidly. Thousands of new transplant professionals were trained, scores of new transplant buildings, wings and wards were opened, and organs became available almost immediately. Waiting times were advertised in weeks and days suggesting that a pool of blood type donors was available for execution and organ harvesting on demand. So for comparison, waiting times in developed countries are measured in months and years, not days and weeks. Um, also throughout this period, China had no voluntary organ donation system. Officials claim that organs came from death row prisoners, but there was a major disconnect between this officially claimed source of organs and the reality that you can observe by looking at original documents in Chinese. The precise number of execution, executed prisoners was unknown, but all available data shows that they were far from enough to account for the volume of transplants. A striking example of this um, can be seen in the year 2007. In that year, reforms to China's judicial system significantly reduced the number of death penalty executions. But in the same year, the largest transplant center in Asia, in Tianjin, was built and began performing probably thousands of transplants annually. And we um, are able to estimate those numbers based on um, triangulating a large range of Chinese language original documents. Uh, the government has never given a credible explanation as to where the organs came from. And um, as uh, Jeffrey has discussed, the leading hypothesis is that prisoners of conscience, especially Falun Gong practitioners, were widely used as an organ source. 
Things changed a little in 2015, where under increasing pressure, Chinese officials claimed that they had stopped using organs from prisoners. They convinced the World Health Organization and other international medical groups that they were sincere in this promise. And uh, PRC officials presented data to support these claims in 2018. The data they presented, however, were extremely thin. And um, Mr. Smith, you held a another congressional hearing uh, soon after those claims came out. Um, so in 2019, myself, uh, Dr. Levy, and the statistician Raymond Hine published a paper in BMC Medical Ethics, and uh, we examined these voluntary um, these claims of voluntary organ donation reforms, looking at the official data. We found that the claimed voluntary organ donation num numbers were extraordinarily close to a simple mathematical model, meaning that the growth of the data was extremely smooth to an unnatural degree. We found no other country with a remotely similar growth trajectory. China's data were between one and two orders of magnitude smoother, that is closer to a simple model, than that of any other country. And because China's numbers were growing so fast, there's even less reason they should have conformed so closely to a simple model or been so smooth. Our research found numerous other contradictory and impossible claims in other official data sets. And this was at the central, provincial, municipal, and hospital levels. We use qualitative and, quali and quantitative analysis. Dr. David Spiegelhalter, a former president of the Royal Statistical Society and a leading statistician in the UK, reviewed our paper and he wrote, I feel their analyses are appropriate. The anomalies in the data follow a systematic and surprising pattern. The close agreement of the number of donors and transplants with a quadratic function, this is the mathematical formula that it um, mapped to almost one to one, um, that the, the close agreement of the numbers and the model is remarkable and is in sharp contrast to other countries who have increased their activity over this period. I cannot think of any good reason for such a quadratic trend arising naturally. The most recent paper Dr. Levy and I produced was published last month in the American Journal of Transplantation and it deals with the involvement of surgeons in heart procurement operations from prisoners. This research uses a combination of data science, clinical forensics and Chinese language text analysis. First, we downloaded 124,000 Chinese language medical papers from academic databases. We then digitized and filtered them down to 2,800 papers about heart and lung procurements. We um, programmed a fuzzy string matching algorithm to search through them for phrases indicative of surgeon participation in executions. And uh, this resulted in 310 papers. And then we examined these one by one very closely and found 71 papers giving explicit descriptions of surgeons appearing to violate the dead donor rule while procuring hearts from prisoners. So in plain language, it means the papers appear to show that the donors who were prisoners were alive at the time of the surgery and were killed by the transplant surgeons in the process of heart extraction. And we have um, many, uh, we provide all of the original sources on um, GitHub and the uh, an open source um, scientific repository and uh, our appendix has all of the excerpts that were used to reach this conclusion. Um, these findings show a uniquely close and long-running collaboration between the PRC's medical establishment and its public security system. It's also likely that many of these transplants were from political prisoners and this would mean that PRC surgeons, many of whom were trained in the West, have been involved in medicalized extrajudicial killing. Though our last finding in the paper was in 2015, we're not certain that this means China ceased the practice. We think it's at least as, if not more plausible, that journals were simply told to stop publishing the incriminating details. The grassroots open source research collective, the World Organization to Investigate the Persecution of Falun Gong, published a detailed Chinese language report of similar findings in September 2014. So this is just before the disappearance of the, you know, these these incriminating admissions. So we think that the absence of further findings from 2015 could be explained either way. It could be the reforms or it could be that they, they simply stop publishing it. And I think in the end, it depends on what one thinks about China's government and political system as to which explanation you know one, one prefers or finds more plausible. The leader of China's transplant sector, Dr. Huang Jiefu, has claimed that the country will be performing 50,000 transplants from voluntary donors by the year 2023. This is an extraordinary claim from a country that has no voluntary, that had no voluntary transplant system to speak of a few years ago. This would be even more transplants than the United States. 
Given what we know about the falsification of organ registry data and the involvement of transplant professionals in the execution of prisoners by organ procurement, there are obviously major questions about the real source of all these organs. I think these questions are particularly urgent now given the mass incarceration, systematic blood testing and biometric surveillance of new political prisoner populations in Xinjiang in recent years, and they are obviously vulnerable to this form of predation. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Robertson, and uh, for this um, really very unique, but also very revealing research that you have done. Uh, it, it just uh, helps to explode the myths uh, that are being promulgated by the Chinese Communist Party and uh, adds to the body of evidence uh, that indicts this system by them. So thank you so very, very much for that. I'd like to now uh, yield the floor to uh, Ethan Gutman and um, uh, such time as he would like to consider. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Gulchera Hoja of RF uh, Radio Free Asia, Serge Jean Belash of Atajur, Kazakhstan Human Rights Group, uh, Rahima Mahmoud of the World Uyghur Congress, and several unnamed but yet heroic Central Asian fixers and researchers who are advancing my investigation. Um, I'll begin with numerical estimates of Uyghurs harvested per year. I'll then move to a specific case study, which I call the Aksu complex, and I'll close with a few ideas about policy. Over the last three years, I've interviewed over 20 Xinjiang camp refugees in Europe, Turkey, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. These were wide-ranging interviews, uh, yet my underlying focus, which was not always revealed to them, was uh, on medical exams and disappearances. Now, there are two kinds of people who leave the camps early. The first are young people, about 18 years old. The announcement that they're graduating uh, is often made during lunch. Sometimes light applause is encouraged. A graduation is a euphemism for forced labor, often at a factory out east. The second group's average age is usually 28 or 29. It could be as low as 25, it could be as high as 35, but the lion's share is about 28. Now that is the exact stage of physical development that the Chinese medical establishment prefers for organ harvesting. Following a camp-wide health check, uh, including comprehensive blood tests, certain individuals are cross-matched for organ harvesting. For example, Sarya Gu, a Chinese teacher, had access to printouts of the blood tests and the matching names, and pink check marks had been manually added to certain names. Other witnesses recalled that certain individuals were forced to wear colored bracelets or vests, sometimes pink, sometimes orange, Either way, approximately a week after the test, the color-coded individuals vanished in the middle of the night. Now, witness testimony from approximately 20 camps is strikingly consistent. Between 2.5% to 5% annual disappearances uh, of the entire camp are made up from this 28-year-old, approximately 28-year-old age group. Now, if we assume that at any given time since 2017, there are approximately a million Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and Hui in the camps. My estimate is that 25,000 to 50,000 camp detainees are being harvested every year. Now, the Kilgore Mathis Gutman report of 2016 estimated China's total transplant volume as 60,000 to 100,000 annually. 28 year olds from the Xinjiang camps could be theoretically harvested for two to three organs. Uh, translating into a minimum of 50,000 organs or a maximum of 150,000 organs. Now, that's not an exact fit, but it gives you the feeling for this, and it's clearly possible to dial these numbers up or down depending on the transplant industry's demands. Uh, now, what does this look like in practice, the physical plants of this? We don't have a complete picture by any means, but if you can picture the following, a re-education camp for 16,000 people. A hospital, Aksu Infection Hospital, that performs organ transplants. A second camp for 33,000 people built around that same hospital. A large crematorium. And all of these structures are less than a kilometer away from each other. 
Now, a Uyghur male who was in and out of the Aksu prison system explained to me that the Aksu infection hospital was originally used for SARS patients. By 2013, it evolved into a treatment center for extreme Muslim dissidents, a re-education hospital is what I'd call it. Uh, the associated crematorium has a prominent sign, and according to him, the air smells like burnt bones. Now, the, another Uyghur male from the Aksu area drove by the crematorium every day, and he adds that the smell was a common complaint among local, local workers. It's a 20-minute drive from the Aksu Infection Hospital to the Aksu Airport, and a human organ transplant channel. This is an export-only fast lane to move human organs east. The Chinese call it a green passage. I've identified one probable end user near Shanghai. First hospital, Jiajing Province. This hospital is a big brother to Aksu Infection Hospital. It's literally called that. And first hospital liver transplants increased by 90% in 2017. Kidney transplants increased by over 200%. On March 1st, 2020, First Hospital performed the world's first double lung transplant on a COVID patient. It was a flare in the night sky for foreign organ tourists. Even during the pandemic, it said, China is open for business. Now I'll conclude with an idea. As a child, I knew that if a citizen of the Soviet Union disagreed with their government, they could be sent to a mental hospital. I also knew that my parents, they were both psychoanalysts, didn't think that was okay. Uh, from 1971 on, the World Psychiatric Association, uh, a bit like my parents, routinely denounced their Soviet counterparts over systematic torture of Russian dissidents. Guided tours of Soviet mental hospitals, which were offered up, were dismissed as Potemkin villages. Soviet psychoanalysts were not welcome at Western conferences. They couldn't publish in Western journals. There was no joint development of psychoactive drugs, and there were no academic exchanges of any kind. The Western consensus was that a, the Soviet psychiatric system represented a dangerous perversion of medicine. Reform was impossible. We couldn't eradicate the Soviet virus, but we could quarantine it. And yet, we actually know more about Chinese transplant hospitals than we ever knew about Soviet mental hospitals. The current problem is the Western medical community's response. Now, I'm not gonna get into the whole back and forth on that here, but I will say this, that I believe, I suspect, that Beijing understood the Western doctors very well. You say that you are here to help. You believe that you have the whip hand, but you are weak. You hunger for the status we can provide. You are afraid of our anger, of causing offense, of being seen as intolerant. Above all, you're afraid of missing out on the financial opportunities of a Chinese world. And to avoid being left behind, you will rationalize nearly anything. So Chinese transplant reform was declared, along with semantic games, fake donation numbers, as, it's, as, as uh, my colleague has just expressed, and false assurances. Chinese harvested adapted by becoming more efficient and focused on a single population in a discrete geographic area. This catastrophe was created by Beijing, yet for the last 10 years, it has been continuously enabled by a handful of Western doctors who thought they could ride the Chinese dragon and come back home as if everything was normal. Now, I don't know the policy mechanisms that can reverse that. But the precedent, it seems to me, is clear. We need to abolish all Western contact with, mainland Chinese trans with the mainland Chinese transplant industry. No Chinese transplant surgeons in our medical journals, our universities, and our conferences. And a freeze on all sales of surgical equipment, pharmaceutical development, and testing in China. That concludes my statement. Thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, thank you so very, very much. Uh, you have been a source for us on the Hill for a long, long time, and I thank you, uh, both the House and the Senate, and really around the world. Uh, thank you again for your testimony and for your leadership, and you know, I'll have some questions uh, at the conclusion of all the uh, testimonies. I'd like to now uh, turn to Dr. Uh, Toti uh, and uh, ask him uh, to provide his testimony and take whatever time uh, you believe you need to take to tell your story, which is very, very unique.
Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, sorry, my commanding of English, so I have to read out my statement. <laughs> my name's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Enver Tokti Bogda, a former surgeon who has extracted organs from an executed prisoner. I was born in the town called Qumul, which is in the eastern part of the East Turkestan, where Chinese referred as Xinjiang. In the summer of 1995, I, it must be a Wednesday, my two, two chief surgeons called me into the office, asked me if I would like to do something wild. I agreed with excitement. They told me to go to the theater and ask for the largest mobile operation pack, take my two assistants and the request for two nurses, inform an anesthesiology department for two, and a statistic as backup, then report to them as 9.30 next day morning at our hospital gate together with our ambulance, which is in fact just a van with a bed in it. <clears throat> next day morning, we have assembled at the gate. Two chief surgeons appeared in a car and told us to follow. The convoy then on its way to the direction of the west. Halfway through our journey, we turned the left. I had never been to this part of the world. Our driver said, this is the way uh, to the Western Mountain execution ground. I felt chilly, even in the hot summer. There was a hill, and our two chief surgeons were there. She said, you wait here. Come around when you hear gunshots. We were scared. Did not dare to ask why. At that moment, I remembered a movie line, gunshot is the command. There were gunshots, not machine gun shooting, but many rifles shoot at the same time. Again, gunshot is the command. I urged my team jumped into the one driving towards the entrance to the field. There were many. 10, 20 corpses were more visible to me to the left on the slope of the hill. Shaved heads with prison uniform. The foreheads were blown up. A police officer shouted at us, say, to the right, far right. The last one is yours. Confused, why is mine? Anyway, no time for that. Moved to the location. Our surgeon called me and told me, hurry up, extract the liver and the two kidneys. Again, word of my superior is the command. I then turned into a trained robot to carry out its duty. It was a man's body in his 30s, unshaved with long hair and a civilian clothes, with a bullet wound to his right chest had already been put in the one. The nurses have prepared the body, two chief surgeons standing on my left, observing my movement. I asked anesthesia. She said, no need. She said, they will do something if it is needed. The man seems already dead anyway. So I started my insertion. The cut designed as upside down letter T shape to expose internal organs as wide as possible. My scalp find its way cutting his skin. Blood can be seen. It implies that his heart was still pumping blood and his body was struggling. He was alive. My chief surgeon whispered to me, hurry up. His word was the commander and I felt it was a kind of assurance that I did this by his order. Whole operation took around 30 to 40 minutes. Chief surgeons were happily put those organs into a weird looking box and said that, okay, now you take your team back to the hospital. Remember there was nothing happened today. I knew this is another command, command too. None of my, team, uh, my crew 
my team have talked about it ever since. However, a news broke out June 2016 that CCP is giving Uyghur people in Xinjiang free national health checkup. Could not find further explanation. We suspect that the CCP is building the national database for organ trade. It is also widely reported that the CCP is carrying DNA tests in the region under glorified title of improving the quality of life of Uyghurs. And that is, I believe, a lie. In the end of the year, according to the Chinese media, Tianshan Net, that the number of samples have been collected and has exceeded 17 million. Now, as the concentration camps are widely built in Xinjiang, that have made organ trade even more convenient than ever. Thank you. I think I'm, that is my statement. Thank you. Doctor, thank you so very much uh, for the bravery of bringing this information forward um, and the clarity that you bring to this entire uh, inquiry into this ongoing abuse. So thank you so very, very much. I'd like to now uh, yield uh, the final to our final witness, uh, uh, Secretary Destro, uh, again, uh, uh, with whatever time he deems appropriate. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, having me in today. I really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, to speak with you and to share some experiences. Uh, please extend my gratitude to Chairman McGovern as well. Um, since I've submitted formal remarks for the record, I'm going to use the short time I have available this morning to share a few additional observations that I draw directly from my experience as the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. I have three of them. First and most important, it's really not enough for Congress to hear evidence about the inhumane behavior of the Chinese Communist Party. You also need evidence about the actions and budget priorities of federal agencies, including the Department of State, USAID, Health and Human Services, the Department of Labor and Customs and Border Protection, among others. These agencies have both the authority and the discretion to monitor the behavior of the CCP and to develop and enforce policies that make it clear to the Chinese and to the American business, academic, and medical communities who work with them that these behaviors are unacceptable. My first country, excuse me, my first concrete suggestion, therefore, is that you hold a hearing, closed if necessary, on how the billions appropriated uh, each year in, uh, for China-related issues actually advance U.S. policy. It, it, it goes without saying that money talks. Second, use the appropriations process to direct funding to projects that will produce actionable intelligence on human rights and corruption in China. The Stop Forest Oregon Harvesting Act of 2021, uh, embodied in H.R. 1592 and its Senate companion uh, S602, provide a good foundation for serious discussion of U.S. government priorities. But no such discussion will be complete without the members of this committee having a good hard look at where we are spending the hard earned money of American taxpayers on China related issues. Third, Congress must engage with the executive branch and the business and medical communities to change what a former C senior State Department official recently described as a culture that excuses operational failure because it, because it is quote unquote impossible to affect change in the behavior of the CCP and other backed actors. That culture is deeply embedded in the State Department and manifests itself as institutionalized foot dragging. While I appreciate the statement issued yesterday by State Department spokesperson Ned Price, decrying the arrest of Cardinal Joseph Zen, Margaret Engie, Margaret Engie He Po Quang, and Denise Ho, these are words, not actions. 
it's time for this committee and the committee committees on appropriations and intelligence to ask some very hard questions of those who implement foreign policy through grants and contracts. Senior State Department officials resisted, downplayed, and ridiculed the rescue of a confirmed victim of organ harvesting from the country in which he was hiding. Senior State Department uh, officials resisted our efforts to convince former Secretary Mike Pompeo to declare that China is conducting an ongoing genocide of its own Uyghur citizens. And members of the business community blanched visibly when members of the Trump administration explained in no uncertain terms that it was serious about halting the input of goods produced by slave labor. Solar, solar panels might be a great place to start. Anyone with significant experience in Washington knows that it is far easier to issue earnest press releases decrying China's bad behavior while simultaneously throwing, trying to accomplish anything measurably concrete. I reject that business as usual approach, but it's a reality. Based on my experience as Assistant Secretary, I can predict with some confidence that bills like the Stop or a Forced Organ Harvesting Act of 2021 will not accomplish their intended purpose until Congress uses its power of the purse to demand accountability from the bureaucracy and the business community. I will close with a concrete example. Exhibit A is the 2021 China Country Report on Human Rights Practices issued by the State Department in March. It adds nothing to what any serious observer already knows. I will quote it in full, and I quote here. Some activists and organizations accuse the government of forcibly harvesting organs from prisoners of conscience, including religious and spiritual adherents, such as the Falun Gong practitioners, detainees in, and detainees in Xinjiang. In June, several UN experts issued a statement expressing alarm concerning allegations of organ harvesting targeting minorities including the Falun Gong practitioners, Uyghurs, Tibetans, Muslims, and Christians in detention in China." Unquote. Really? Is that it? This is what bureaucratic foot dragging really looks like. Unless and until this Congress demands fiscal accountability for the billions spent every year on human rights activities, nothing will change. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your question. Thank you, sir, very much, uh, Secretary Destro. Uh, very wise counsel, and um, we will follow up on it, and I can assure you. Let me ask if I could, um, um, our Dr. Uh, Toti, uh, if you could, uh, as a, again, a courageous whistleblower, uh, are there any or many others like you who have come forward uh, with information that, that, again, brings light and scrutiny to this barbaric practice. Uh, and, and did you find that American um, uh, medical doctors who are, and other personnel in the transplant uh, business uh, to be shocked at what is going on? Or do they just look the other way and say, um, you know, the greater good of somehow procuring an organ for someone, uh, you know, outweighs the terrible barbaric nature of how it was procured. Uh, but are there others like you? Well, <clears throat> I wish uh, that there are others uh, like me um, in the world to speak out. Um, uh, there are many, many uh, doctors who have done it and they, they, knew, they knew that that is something wrong. But uh, since that um, tightened the control of the CCP, not many the able to speak out because of the family uh, security problems. And also speaking about um, American doctors or other doctors uh, working on these similar issues, what I believe is that uh, even though they are working in China, they have been kept in the dark. For example, uh, they may have told the source of organ 
it's a, a come from executed and prisoner or somewhere uh, totally no, uh, totally uh, normal and uh, they may just kept this uh, vital information from those born doctors and then that has made this uh, medical uh, community around the world hard to believe such things actually is happening in china and uh, what um, i understood is that um, western people they tend to believe that it is too bad to be true just like another expression too good be, uh, to be true that is uh, uh, opposite to it but ccp is uh, very skillful in doing such things make you not to believe it and unfortunately that is the truth what's going on now i appreciate that um those that are still inside the country obviously would be hard pressed but are there others who are now part of the diaspora uh who would be willing to have the bravery of course we know the chinese communist party is notorious for going after family members and friends uh, who remain behind uh, i mean one of the first people i worked on coming out of uh, her case was rabia kadir uh, and she sat right across where I'm sitting right now years ago, and they had her sons uh, arrested. Now her entire extended family uh, in Xinjiang is uh, either incarcerated or in some way being brutalized. Uh, and it goes for all the others as well. But are there, I mean, when we had our hearing uh, with that guard, uh, we protected his identity out of profound fear of retaliation um, that could happen, you know, back in back in China. Uh, but are there any, especially in the diaspora, who could be encouraged to come forward uh, to break this, this see no evil, hear no evil um, mentality, as you said, uh, too bad to be true, uh, too horrible to be true, so they don't believe it? Yeah. Well, I heard it as a, a Chinese surgeon uh, in the United States claimed the asylum a few years ago. Then when I tried to contact him, then he disappeared. And I don't think he has been uh, captured by China, but he just disappeared into the uh, American uh, society and then he kept quiet. Again, all the more reason why we're so grateful for your courage. Thank in you. Coming forward, doctor. Uh, you know, the American Society of Transplantation in 2013 said that they welcomed uh, the new national policy uh, out of China. Um, it has been my experience. I've been a congressman for 42 years. I have worked on Chinese human rights abuses since I got here. Uh, my first uh, uh, amendment was in 1983 on the whole forced abortion issue and the complicity of groups like the UN Population Fund and others uh, as part of the one child per couple policy. And I was shocked at how many seemingly good people, particularly in the human rights field, just looked the other way as if it wasn't happening. Uh, there was a hearing in 1985 um, and I didn't share that hearing, but it was a Democrat hearing in which they said the high tides and the forced abortion had all abated. You know, it was it was it was in the rearview mirror. It was over uh, to a large extent. And we know that there were swings of high tides is now being used as a as a part of their genocidal campaign against the uh, the Uyghurs, as we know as well. And it is a violation of the genocide convention. But there's always this willingness. We see it in religious freedom as well. Um, you know, as Xi Jinping does the synthesization of, of religion and, and systematically uh, 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 either co-ops or destroys uh, communities of faith. We saw it with Hong Kong. I'm the author of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act of 2014. And when I introduced it, uh, it was met with such scorn that Xi Jinping will never violate the basic law or the UK Sino Agreement, which is an international treaty. Uh, they will respect it. It'll always be an icon of democracy and look down. And as uh, Secretary Destro pointed out, even Cardinal Zen, uh, who is an amazing faith leader uh, and a truth teller, uh, is now uh, been arrested uh, in Hong Kong. So, uh, so on this, where there's a profit motive, uh, and you have you know the American Society as back in 2013. Uh, kind of like saying, yep, everything's fine. We saw it on the whole trade issue. Uh, I vigorously opposed Bill Clinton in May 26 of 1994 when he delinked human rights from trade. And that just told the Chinese Communist Party that all we care about are profits, that human rights is a rhetorical 
uh, statement. It's page five of our talking points when we have uh, interfaces with their government. And, and the business community was awful, in my opinion, in enabling and being witting accomplices uh, in uh, this, this barbaric uh, party. There, there could have been, there could have been, I think, real reforms in a different China today uh, had we insisted on linking human rights with trade. Uh, and unfortunately, he didn't uh, do that. So uh, my question to the panelists, um, you know, the enabling, again, and you've all kind of pointed to it, of, of groups uh, that and, and Western doctors in the US, the UK, Europe, elsewhere in, in Asia uh, that have clients who want an organ uh, and then they just look the other way as to its origin. And secondly, uh, how much money is made with every organ transplant? I mean, the, the, who gets paid? You know, how, what's the, the order of battle there or the, uh, you know, in terms of this one gets that much, this one gets that much? You know, the, the as you pointed out, sixty to one hundred thousand dollars, sixty thousand to one hundred thousand. Uh, it's good, man. You you had mentioned earlier, two to three organs, I guess, from each forced donor. Uh, and do leadership in the CCP get donors uh, get organs here? You know, I don't think we focused on that much in the past. Um, um, you know, they 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 have breakdowns in their systems, and all of a sudden they need a liver. Do they turn to the Falun Gong practitioners or others uh, in order to get that? Um, so that would be, um, and, and let me also ask if you could, um, the UN Human Rights, you know, Sir Jeffrey Nice, nice I should say, uh, again, your, your, your historic work that you've done, what has the UN Human Rights Council, how have they received this information? How has the uh, other bodies of the UN, um, you know, looked at this uh, as a, uh, why are they so reluctant to really speak out and make this a major issue? Um, uh, as we know from the genocide Olympics just completed, um, even there, there was a reluctance to, uh, to call out China for its terrible, barbaric and cruel behavior. So, um, yes, if you can unmute, um, if you don't mind. Most of the questions are best answered by the others, but can I just deal with the last question about the Human Rights Council? Please do. Because uh, courtesy of ETAC, the NGO, it was possible for Hamid Sabi, uh, on our behalf and with me present, to make a presentation, a 90-second presentation of the standard format in the Human Rights Council concerning the work we had done. And it was remarkable to us from conversations we had, how strong is the influence of China on the Human Rights Council? Um, we would be perhaps betraying one or two confidences to go as far as I might privately, but it was very clear that people were afraid both to talk and almost to think sometimes. And we had organized on that occasion a side event, and even at the door of the side event, the Chinese representatives were present trying to stop us even having that side event. Um, so I, I think we, you would have to be realistic. We all have to be realistic about the power that goes to countries that fund these international institutions. The International Criminal Court is forever at risk because of lack of or possible lack of funds. The UN likewise, and as long as choices made by other countries that the People's Republic of China can be a major funder of the Human Rights Council, why then it will have influence and will be disinclined to respond to information of the kind you're dealing with today. Thank you. And just on that point, when under Kofi Annan, when they, they were talking about reforming the commission to a council, um, it fell far short, especially keeping rogue nations like China and others who commit atrocities off the off the council. Uh, I've been to it many times, uh, argued, brought issues relevant to China and other human rights abusers, Darfur, when that was very much in the news. And I was always shocked about how they were running interference 24-7, like you said, work at the door uh, to try to prevent people from um, uh, attending. And certainly those who come are being you know, check out who they are for further um, in, intimidation tactics. So thank you for that. 
And can, I, can I just add a little coda? Sure. Um, on the 17th, or was it the 19th of June of 2019, when I read the judgment of the China Tribunal in London, in public, Newsnight, the premier evening political programme, had a film to screen at half past ten. I've been informed with no reason to doubt the source of information at all that in the afternoon the British Foreign Office made a request that that film should not be shown. There may have been other reasons for its not being shown, but it never has been shown. It featured, I think, can't remember if it featured Mr. Levy, but um, um, Mr. Totty, but it was going to feature your intended witness, Jacob Levy, who's a, who's a really critical uh, witness in the overall history of these matters. And that, of course, was not necessarily direct China influence, that it would probably be trade-related influence operating on the British Foreign Office at the time when everybody wanted to be China's friend. Thank you. Would others like to uh, answer some of those earlier questions? Uh, yeah, I can um, speak a little about the um, uh, issues internal to China about organ transplantation. You asked, first of all, about the potential size of the industry and then um, the the access of Chinese Communist Party leaders. Uh, we lost you. Oh, sorry. OK, here I am. Thank you. <clears throat> so on the size, I'm looking here at um, Ethan and the Two Davids report. And they've got archives from a Chinese hospital website from 2005. And it's just a list of US dollar, you know, kidney transplant, 60,000, liver transplant, 98 to 130,000, uh, lung transplant, 150 to 170,000, and so on. So, you know, with 10,000 transplants a year at 100K a clip, you know, that's a billion dollars. You could easily see a several billion dollar industry easily. Um, the... I suspect that the entire industry um, began as a way of um, ensuring access to organs for the um, party elite. And I suspect this because um, a transplant professional has been on the healthcare committee of the CCP, either as a chair or vice, vice chair, uh, for many, many decades. And uh, the healthcare committee of the CCP it specifically looks after the health of the party leadership. The leader of the transplant sector now, Dr. Huang Jiefu, is a vice chair on that committee. And that's one of his most important titles, um, you know, as a party member. It's not his um, it's not his role as a medical administrator. It's his role as a, a party cadre and someone who services the health of the party leadership. Secondly, the um the leading hospitals in organ transplantation are military hospitals especially the 301 and 309 military hospitals, and they have among the most sophisticated transplant setups. And those hospitals specifically cater to um, party officials and, and high-level military officials. So it's very unlikely that they will be running out of organs and needing to come to the United States. Um, I think the entire purpose was to secure this service for the CCP, just like they have their own, um, you know, organic food supplies, you know, private, you know, high quality food um, distribution system specifically for the party elite um, and other healthcare services, I suspect organs were, you know, part of these privileges that accrue to um, being a party member. I appreciate that. Is that widely understood, Mr. Robertson? I don't think so. I, I mean, among, so. And I appreciate I mean, you not among the public, certainly. Yes. But I mean, uh, even among policymakers that, you know, Falun Gong practitioners, hearts, lungs, and other organs are being transplanted forcibly into high Chinese Communist Party officials. Uh, I, I don't know, but I mean, it should be, I think. Mr. Smith, uh, yes, I, I have heard recent, uh, some recent uh, <clears throat> chatter about that very issue. Uh, if you look at what's going on in in uh, shanghai you're also seeing the lockdowns in beijing parts of beijing uh, you're seeing it in hong kong and other places uh, but there was a recent announcement uh, about the uh, the evacuation of the government center from beijing and uh, and the uh, 
you know, one of the points that I was trying to make in my own testimony is that uh, if if the Human Rights Report is the uh, and, and and I have to commend the staff. I think they do a good job under very difficult circumstances. You know, but but our intelligence community needs to be all over this, and they're not. And uh, it's just uh, it's politically incorrect to raise these questions. There's way too much money involved in raising these questions. And uh, and I have to say that it is a uh, uh, there's a lot of money to be made in in the organ business. So uh, so at any event, I think that uh, I think that this is this is well worth, an avenue well worth pursuing. Uh, unfortunately, I have to agree that uh, using the international organizations is if I, it should be filed under W for a waste of time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gutman? I just had wanted to respond to your first question, which I'm going to completely mischaracterize as, why do good doctors go bad in China? Okay, so uh, uh, there's a couple of points. Uh, that I see in that. I, I think that's what you were getting at a little bit. But, well, one thing is just straight, na straightforward naivete. Um, they, for some reason, Western doctors don't hire, do what business people do, which is they hire consultants. They hire sort of on the ground fixers, expats, or sometimes natives who will help them negotiate, okay? No one in business goes into China without that kind of help anymore. That's gone. Those, the, the very brief period where people did do that, but they all lost their shirts. Uh, the second thing is the Chinese, uh, you know, these, I don't think of this as necessarily so badly intentioned. Maybe that's the way my testimony uh, sounded. And I, I, I don't want to, I, I would say it's a little more difficult or a little more complex than that. The Chinese do set up a dichotomy, a kind of melodrama of good and evil. Uh, and part of this is the pretense that there are two sides in China. One is very good and one is very bad. And there's a, you know, and Huang Jiefu represents the reformers who are very good, right? And if you can just empower us and don't embarrass us and don't embarrass China, then the good will win, okay? Uh, now that feeds into a lot of fantasies that Westerners have always had from the Soviet Union to now about uh, uh, the East. One is the Western rescue fantasy, okay? Uh, we can sort of rescue these people, we can help out this country and so forth. The other is uh, not the, the rescue fantasy, but the, uh, the uh, fantasy of, of the future, that this is, I've seen the future and it is China, okay? Uh, so I think all that comes in. And then finally, there's a financial aspect here. Uh, and that financial aspect is, is very, very alluring. And uh, even some of the people who maybe don't even need the money are very attracted to the kind of power that is represented by the money rushing <laughs> rushing through the system. Now, I can't explain to you what is the financial order of battle here. I can't explain to you how, you know, from from the uh, from the guy sweeping up in the hospital, does he get a special, get anything out of these organ transplants? I don't know, really, I don't. And the Chinese are, are very good at uh, disguising the sort of follow the money aspect, okay? Uh, and that's always been true in Chinese business because most people don't want to pay taxes at all. So I would just say, so we don't know that part of it, but we do know that there's a lot of money and we do know these deals are available to uh, doctors. And, and we can see that a lot in the case of Germany, for example, where a, a bunch of heart transplant surgeons seem, seemingly got involved. And I believe, uh, according to uh, Arnie Schwartz's research, uh, made a lot, made a killing about this. You know, uh, Mr. Gutman, I want to thank you as well as uh, Gordon Chang, who we've had at previous hearings uh, for raising, you know, the concerns with such uh, accurate data about human rights abuses. So I want to thank you and he for for that kind of leadership. Because you know, otherwise we get we get a we get a lot of baloney uh, from people, including in the U.S. government, who just look askance. Uh, I mean, this issue has been so trivialized, so ignored. Uh, for so long, and you know, we've been raising it through hearings, through bills that, that they don't get marked up because it's not politically correct. And the State Department says, "We oh, we got to look into that further," and they never do. So, um, you know, this idea of denying, but also trivializing. Um, you know, if you're the victim and you're having your organs taken out, and uh, whether you're a, a 
awake or not, but certainly if you're awake, uh, it, it, I can't think of an atrocity. I mean, this is Nazi-like. Uh, and, you know, the, the Chinese properly have, 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 have criticized some of the terrible things that were done by the Japanese during the occupation during World War II. I read a book uh, about the unit, I believe it was 731. I got to go back to my memory banks. To, uh, but I, when I read that, I, I, I was sickened that people could do this to people, prisoners, and they were, a lot of them were prisoners who were, were either Chinese, American, or UK, or Australian. And, and so I, I just raised that, and now they're doing it. They're doing it every day of the week. Um, let me just ask, um, there's a lot of collaboration with the United States and, and, and um, uh, government, whether it be NIH, CDC, you know, uh, uh, we know that China has its own CDC, um, and we work with them on a lot of things, even the whole virus. You know, there's still open questions, which I think uh, have not been answered adequately, a lot of cover-up about, you know, the origins of, of, of the... Uh, of the pandemic, COVID-19, but um, my, my, has the U.S. government, um, anyone who would like to take this, particularly the NIH and CDC, you know, they're, they're with a lot of these people all the time, um, you know, collaborating, uh, having meetings with them, and of course the NGOs, the, the, the doctor associations, you know, are they naive or are they just willing to look the other way? Uh, but why aren't we speaking out through our our, our healthcare diplomacy, uh, which is a part of NIH, uh, of, as we all know, and certainly um, um, CDC uh, and NIH do work on that as well, uh, about this terrible, terrible abuse. Why, why, the, why the silence? Well, Mr. Chairman, this is Bob Destro. I, uh, I, I'll take that question in part because that's why I made the point about getting into the guts of the grants and contracts. Uh, now that I've been at the State Department, uh, I had one of the smaller foreign assistance budgets. It was only a billion and a half dollars, and, and only in Washington would that be considered a, a small sum. You know, but the fact is that there is no oversight, zero, of how that money actually gets spent, and uh, and and the people who get the money. Uh, you know, get it, and and it's basically cycled through American organizations, who if they ask hard questions, are not going to get the money. Uh, and so, I mean, I was told, and this has nothing to do with well, it has has to do with East Asia, but I was actually told uh, that I really needed to approve a a grant where uh, the grantee actually had done a horrible job, and everybody agreed that they had done so. And I was reminded that it would be very politically unpopular if I canceled the grant. You know, so it is a, uh, you know, I, I can't underscore enough how necessary it is to follow the money. That money comes back here, uh, NIH uh, and CDC and, and, uh, and Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins, you know, if, if you look at the record, what, you were, what you're going to find is that they bypass the authorizing committees and go directly to appropriations where they get what they want. So, so that's uh, part of the problem. Uh, there was a long time ago, there was a, 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 a cartoon strip called Pogo. And one of the famous, uh, famous statements is, we have met the enemy and he is us. Thank you, Secretary. Can I add to something? Yes, please do. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, at just one point, the whole world is missing out is that uh, how the CCP treating a normal human being's life. In CCP's eyes, only just uh, CCP's members treated as human being, but all others is their asset of the state or asset of the Communist Party. Therefore, they can do whatever they want. So using human body for medical purpose is not new. For example, this book on, on page 298, it says, as is a footnote, it says, and then uh, internal bureau, uh, head of internal bureau of CCP, 
was called Kang Sheng. And he, Kang Sheng authorized us to kill three counter revolutionaries for medical purposes. And that is 1943. So, the West, they think this is a human being. How can you do things to the human being? But in the CCP's eye, if you are not the Communist Party member, you're probably just same as asset, same as his car or his something, not as human being. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, is there anything else anybody would like to add? Uh, yes. Um, on, on your earlier point, Yes, it's been quite heartening recently to see that organizations such as the British Medical Association have made pronouncements based on either the Uyghur or the Euro China Tribunal without even consulting us, which is even better because it just is now part of the record for consideration. But had you been able to have present as was a hoped for Professor Martin Elliott, the um, consultant surgeon who was part of the uh, China Tribunal panel, the most uh, formidable uh, former um, clinical director of the most famous children's hospital, the Great Ormond Street Hospital, he and I were summoned, not summoned, to, asked to attend on a BMA, a British Medical Association, British Surgeons Association uh, meeting. And coming directly to your point about did they look the other way, it, it may be that the proper inference is that until there is very clear evidence that cannot be rejected, it's easier not even to ask the question. Once the evidence emerges, there's a desire to be skeptical, perhaps in the interest of professional relationships with people who you've got on well at conferences and in hospitals and stuff like that from China. But once the evidence is absolutely clear, then and at that moment, whatever disinclination to face reality is tends to disappear and the response to duty is, is the first action. So I don't think it's looking away in a, in a nasty, a wicked way. It's a natural inclination or temptation that needs to be dislodged. And the better, clearer, firmer, more objective the evidence, the easier it is to dislodge that inclination. Thank you for that point. Let me just uh, also make an appeal a strong appeal. We have a number of news organizations and journalists who are on this, uh, watching this, and we will get it to many more uh, at the conclusion uh, who expressed an interest. Uh, my hope and appeal to them would be they have to start asking questions. Um, you know, the New York Times, Washington Post, Washington Times, uh, liberal left, conservative right, who cares? Start doing the investigative journalism uh, that adds to the accuracy in the picture. I mean, you, you're all doing uh, breakthrough work and historical work, but more eyes than ears uh, and, and, you know, incisive commentary by these individuals, investigative journalists, uh, can blow this wide open. Uh, and, and again, you know, not new, but, but maybe a new emphasis that it's not just the huge profits that we gleaned uh, from this barbaric behavior, uh, but this is also a way of keeping the high leadership, including maybe in Xi Jinping, if he ever needs a new lung or a heart or a liver, he might get it from a Falun Gong practitioner uh, who he absolutely despises and hates and has declared war on, or from a Muslim uh, who is being horrifically treated as well, who happens to be 28 years old or something like that. So it's a, and I think we need to, you know, get that further opened. So my appeal to the journalists would be, please ask the hard questions yourselves through your contacts. The U.S. government has to do it. The U.K., all the governments, particularly in democracies, need to be asking these questions. Um, so, but thank you. Uh, we do have um, uh, uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee from Texas, a distinguished member of our commission, uh, who, uh, and I yield to her for such time as she may consume. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much. And this has been a powerful hearing uh, to my dismay, um, the very fact that in 2022, we are holding such a hearing, which means that uh, I'll use the terminology, uh, death and destruction continue in what should be a sacred and vital life-saving effort as so many in the United States continue to wait on transplant list. Uh, and we are guided certainly by the pain of their families, but guided by 
uh, the sheer decency and humanity uh, that we should be guided by. So with, saying, with that said, let me um, blatantly ask the question after I've thanked all the witnesses, um, uh, is um, uh, China um, or is there murder involved uh, still uh, when uh, these practices are engaged? Uh, is, is there, uh, has there been documentation uh, that there have been more than one organ uh, taken um, and uh, particularly in the Falun Gong, we know those camps are closed in 2014, but um, did that happen? And number one, um, and I'm gonna ask a, a second uh, question that may have a follow-up. Um, sad that the Falun Gong has been the, the, the fodder for this, but I'd be eager to see if there are other Chinese as well. But um, in this uh, effort to re-educate and have voluntary donations uh, and the establishment of a um, sort of rational ethical organ registry and maybe interaction with medical professionals from around uh, the, the world, has, that, has there been any improvement uh, in how this process is utilized? Uh, maybe the secretary and the doctor and others can follow, but I've never seen China, uh, Chairman Smith, shamed by challenges or charges of human rights abuses. It looks like it rolls off their back, except for the fact they get angry with the accuser uh, and blame them uh, for um, not recognizing the brilliance of China. I've never seen them uh, come to the table and, and say, you're right, um, in any large way. So I'd be interested in whether we've had any impact uh, on um, our efforts. So the first is just the sheer brutality of it and any records of that where um, people are simply killed because you've taken so many organs. And then the second question. Thank you very much. I may have a follow-up. Thank you. Secretary, the doctor, any witnesses can start? Very briefly, the judgment of the tribunal up to 2019 found indeed that crimes against humanity in the form of murder had been committed on a large scale. So the answer to your first question is undoubtedly yes. As to the position since 2019, the tribunal found there was no reason to believe the practice had stopped. However, the tribunal is not a continuing functioning body. It more or less presented a judgment frozen at the time of judgment, so far as evidence is concerned. And Matthew Robertson or Ethan Goodman will be better able to answer you on the position, position between 2019 and today. Thank you. Thank you. Any, uh, and, and, I'd be happy to just uh, take the brief point that uh, the all the evidence I've run across, because uh, only one person of the camp refugees that I interviewed, and believe me, it's very hard to get hold of camp refugees. The Chinese are yes. extremely careful about releasing them. And in fact, the whole movement is the other way, uh, to take people out of Central Asia and bring them to China, back to China. Now, of those 20 people, only one of them said he didn't remember any disappearances. And I, he was Kazakh. And I said, well, uh, so nobody disappeared. And he said, well, not, not among the Kazakhs. And I said, well, uh, what about the Uyghurs? And he said, I only care about the Kazakhs. He was a very honest fellow, a uh, very endearing guy, actually. But the fact is, every one of them remembered these sorts of disappearances. Now, nobody would deny, for example, that 18-year-olds uh, are being used for forced labor in China. I mean, no one. There's not a, a soul on earth, as far as I can tell, who would deny. Yet when it comes to this mysterious disappearances of 20, uh, 28-year-olds shortly after a blood test, uh, to me, it seems fairly obvious what's going on. They've been checked. They've been, they've been cross-matched. And now they're being harvested, taken away. Uh, and it's meeting the demands, which gets into the voluntary donation issue. Uh, nobody knows. I don't think Matt knows, but maybe he does. Uh, but I don't think anyone knows what the actual voluntary donation numbers in China are. 
I'll just add one thing. I suspect they're fairly low. And that is not because, you know, there's some Chinese belief in the sanctity of the body. It is because everyone in China knows one thing. This is a dirty business, a filthy business. And you should get paid if you, you know, there's a lot of money in this business and you should get paid before you volunteer your organs. Uh, so I think that's a, a basic in this. Uh, uh, and if some, if if they do, they have any um, qualms, and I'll yield to you with the persons dying <laughs> by this effort, meaning the, taking uh, strategic organs, taking more than one, and so you may follow up with that. Yes, uh, Congresswoman Lee uh, Jackson Lee, if I can add something to this, uh, there's two points. One, there is considerable evidence uh, that I have seen, uh, video evidence that uh, that you know is the functional equivalent of an auto chop shop. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's pretty shocking, uh, and uh, it's and it's not just that they take big organs; they also take uh, they also nibble, you know. So it's a it's a big business uh, involving both living and dead donors. Uh, but I, I think we make a mistake if we don't put this into a broader context. Uh, you know, perhaps better than most, that anybody who really cares about civil rights looks at patterns and practices. Uh, and, and the Chinese have a pattern and practice of being what, what I called in my written statement, an extraction society. So everything is about extracting resources, whether they're human resources, physical resources, uh, mineral resources, food resources, and you look across the globe at their behavior. Uh, it's not an accident that many of my good friends uh, who live in Africa consider the yeah. Chinese to be worse than the Belgians. Uh, yeah. They take and they never give back. The same thing is happening to our friends in the Caribbean, you know. So, uh, so you know, let's put organ harvesting in the in the proper context in the bigger picture, and say this is just par for the course. Uh, they don't care about people; uh, they care about uh, about profit and and their own well being. I think you I think you've nailed uh, uh, the the nail on the head uh, tragically. Wish I hadn't heard that because uh, uh, you wonder what impact you'll have. And so I'll just finish on my final question is, what impact have we, uh, the legislation that we passed, or they're dealing with um, organ uh, harvesting um, and uh, the United States horror about this on an international basis, has that had any impact? on saving lives or, or having China and others, of course, express their international outrage. Have they altered anything besides the so-called registry? Um, just a quick comment. Uh, I don't know that the US um, has done much at all really about this, but um, I, I could be mistaken. Maybe there's something I've missed. Um, but uh, recently the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation has um, basically banned Chinese surgeons from um, uh, presenting at its conferences and publishing in its journal. Um, and this is um, a significant development. <clears throat> Dr. Levy, my co-author, um, helped to um, you know make that happen. And I think it's those kind of efforts by um, you know professional organizations that will move the needle. Um, the it's not i don't think it's the case that the prc officials don't care what the world thinks they have gone uh, to tremendous efforts to shape the narrative about their transplantation system and to co-opt international medical organizations uh, and to kind of win win them over in supporting the official story about transplantation in china and this has been um you know something that has been well, would appear to be highly coordinated and um, and very very well thought through um, and very successful, I would say, um, because if these organizations, for example, um, if we just imagine that if the World Health Organization or the Transplantation Society 
had been um, putting resources into investigating this issue and uh, doing the kind of thing that the China Tribunal ended up doing um, so many years after the claims had first come out, which is, of course, not, you know, that's just how it happened. But they've known about this for a very long time. So one imagines that the impact might have been so much greater um, and could have saved a lot of lives if the international medical organizations had been on board on this issue. And I think one of the main reasons they haven't is because of um, PRC efforts to influence them um, in very subtle and sophisticated ways over many years. So I think they really do care. Uh, the case of psychiatric abuse that Ethan mentioned um, in the Soviet Union is similar, but the same thing happened with China in um, from 2004 to 2006 or so where the, the uh, World Psychiatric Association put, uh, they established a committee and they put China under a lot of pressure. And uh, in the end, the, um, the Chinese Psychiatric Association essentially stopped. They, I mean, they were the ones who were kind of forced to do it by the public security authorities, but they basically stopped using psychiatric abuse against political prisoners in a systematic way. They never, they never admitted that they did it, and they acted um, with umbrage and uh, that at the at the very idea that they would be accused of this. And yet, the abuses actually stopped, and that was basically because um, of the you know their peers shaming them and uh, casting them out internationally and stuff. In that case, it was Human Rights Watch that put its um, institutional energy behind that. Um, and so that shows the the impact that, uh, you know, a major credible international organization with appropriate resources and, um, you know, these, you know, connections to elite networks in media and so on, uh, it can have a big impact. I think it would be difficult to have as much influence on the organ transplant issue because um, it's such a huge industry in China but it would, it would at least be something. So I don't think any of these things can be overlooked. Well, let me, uh, Matthew, thank you for being straightforward and uh, pointing right back that we may not have done all that uh, we should do. This is obviously a horror. And I asked the question of which I probably could have answered, uh, which is many of these individuals, um, and many is a poor word, uh, die. Uh, and under the extraction theory, uh, the Chinese would have little caring of such uh, since they maintain, I think, about uh, three million or so slaves in some form or another uh, of their own people dealing with forced labor. And they are obviously uh, ripe for utilization in this very horror-filled um, story and effort. So um, I'm, I'm moved to, I think this is something we, we have so many items of need on the commission's plate but i think this is something that um also has a, uh, the need for if the united states is not where it should be to uh push this uh, forward uh, because we know that china may not have a concern but certainly the world opinion and any effort to let the world know of what is going on with innocent persons and again murder still continues as evidenced by the tribu tribunal uh, and um, the latter uh, interviews, albeit small, after 2019. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the image of China uh, that they pretend uh, is um, beyond fake and it is destructive as to what they're doing around the world and to their own people. So um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will uh, take this moment to yield back and appreciate all the witnesses' reaffirmation of the work that we um, should be continuing to do. Thank you again. Ms. Jackson Lee, thank you very much for your very your wonderful questions, but for your deep concern. You know, we are trying, one of the reasons why we put together this hearing is that I've introduced the Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Act, and so far we have been unable to get it marked up and brought to the floor. Uh, and that bill, uh, and Tom Swazi is the chief co-sponsor of, of that legislation, uh, would establish property blocking, visa blocking sanctions, similar to what we did with the Bandisky Act and the Belarus Democracy Act and other bills. Um, uh, it would prohibit exports of surgery devices to entities that are identified as being responsible for forced organ harvesting uh, or related human trafficking and requiring some serious reporting 
on the part of the U.S. Department of State getting to some of the questions uh, or the concerns raised by by the uh, the Secretary uh, uh, Bob Destro. So you know, please help us with that. I know your commitment. Uh, please help us to get that to the floor. It's like it's ready to go. Uh, and I think it would make a huge difference. And, you know, Mr. Um, um, Robertson, you did point out that the head of uh, the Oregon Transplant Thanks, Secretary, I will. Thanks. oh, thank you so much. And I know you will, you, you're always true to your word, uh, that they're talking about performing 50,000 transplants from voluntary donors by 2023, which would be some indication that a already barbaric program is expanding um, when, and as you point out, they have no voluntary transplant uh, system to speak of. Uh, so there's there's that concern that, you know, the market is growing. And, um, you know, if anyone has any sense of how many Americans uh, wittingly or unwittingly are a part of this, that would be helpful to us. And then with regards to American complicity, uh, what other U.S. organizations do we need to be calling out, whether they be professional medical or others? Um, uh, I mean, we'll invite them to another hearing and hold them to account and ask them the hard questions um, in the hopes maybe they come, maybe they don't, but they need to be asked the hard questions. But again, we need to get our Stop Force Organ Harvesting Act uh, out on the floor as quickly as possible uh, to make a difference here. You know, it's not a panacea, but it becomes a very serious uh, attempt to try to mitigate this, ter this horrific and barbaric behavior. Uh, so if there's any other organizations or associations that need to be called out, you know, please convey that to us uh, now or in the written form uh, so we can, again, systematically uh, promote uh, an end to this, pro this practice. No, no, but I'd like to make one point when this question please has do. been... Can I, can I make one point? Please do. Let, let your question be answered first. I mean, if nobody wants to answer that question, there's some point I wanted to make. And it has to do with what a reference to Human Rights Watch and also back to the reference to early um, practices serving the interests of high-level Communist Party officials. It, I don't expect people to read the judgment of the China Tribunal in full, that would only take about an hour and a half, I suppose, uh, before you get through to the footnotes. But you'll find at paragraph 198, uh, for three pages, something that we did not count as evidence, but that came to my attention and after uh, we'd delivered judgment and therefore appeared, after we'd finished the hearings rather, and appears in the judgment. And it relates to uh, a very important human rights report with which I expect you're all aware of 1994, which was looking at the capital punishment issue rather than particularly the forced organ harvesting issue. But what I found so striking in that report, and very sadly, the author of that report has fairly recently uh, passed away. What I found striking in that report was a system dealing with uh, Representative Jackson's concern, a system for killing, followed by organ extraction, that was a long time in place from the 1980s onwards. And all that needed to happen for the conclusions reached in the judgment to be true is for the door in the prison that used to open onto one system to be replaced by another door in the same prison. So if ever you find people querying the conclusions of this document, invite them to refer back to a system to the 1994 Human Rights Watch report. And in case this is my very last contribution, I apologize for my, the presence of my cat, who there is no door on this part of my house. And it would be flippant of me on a serious occasion to observe that the cat is a Siamese cat, and therefore coming from Siam might have had a heightened interest in your proceedings. But I realize lightheartedness is not appropriate. No, it's, it's always appropriate. Thank you. Would anyone else uh, like to quickly get back to us with those organizations that we need to be calling out? That would be helpful. Um, you know, whether it be professional medical, you know, uh, it would be very, 
helpful for us to be able to because obviously some of these doctors uh, collaborate they they train you know here not all of them of course and um you know if there's unwitting enabling of this or winning we need to know it uh chairman smith uh i do have a couple of uh, real short observations uh, i want to i know i sound like a broken record when i say this but you do have to follow the money uh, my colleague at Catholic University, uh, uh, Chang Guan Chang, the, the barefoot lawyer, uh, you know, explained recently to a former very senior official that the Chinese buy compliance, uh, they buy silence. So yeah. the, the idea that follow the money is, uh, is, uh, is important uh, is I, I cannot underestimate that. The other part is, is you know, really a plea uh, for those of you on the Hill. I mean, you are the ones who make policy. And in a bill that virtually nobody at the State Department had, was either aware of or has, has ever read uh, is the Foundations of Evidence-Based Policy Act, which was adopted by Congress, bipartisan, uh, co-sponsored by Senator Patty Murray and former Speaker Paul Ryan that requires uh, federal agencies to demonstrate, affirmatively demonstrate, that their policies actually accomplish something. I'm telling you, if you actually ask somebody, what does a good outcome look like? You're not gonna get an answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, the answer you'll get is, well, you know, that would really upset people. Well, we know that, you know, but either we want a good outcome or we don't want a good outcome. We want this uh, compelled or, or organ harvesting to stop. It's not impossible, you know, if you follow those money those money trails. And uh, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Any uh, final comments or answers to those questions? Uh, well, if not, I, I again want to thank our amazing panel for your insights. Uh, our hope is that we can get our bill on the floor as quickly as possible, but it's far more than that that needs to be done. We need a full court press by the administration, by the Congress, by the Parliament in the UK and everywhere else. Uh, uh, so thank you for the amazing work you all have all done. It's just, uh, it's extraordinary. And for the victims, um, um, you, you are their best friend. The hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Well, Oh. Thank you.